Hello, everybody, and welcome to the TeacherCast Educational Network. My name is Jeff Bradbury, and thank you so much for joining us today and making TeacherCast your home for professional development. This is Ask the Tech Coach podcast, episode number 53. Today, we're talking all about Google Sites and how they have revolutionized the way teachers are creating digital lessons for their students. We have a great guest with us. He is a Google certified innovator. I want to introduce our friend, Mr. Tom Mullaney. Tom, welcome to the show. How are you today? I am great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this uh, conversation. I am looking forward to hearing all about the great things that you guys are doing. But before we get into Tom and his background, I want to tell you guys about the ISTE conference. Tom, you're going to the ISTE conference soon, aren't you? I am. I am looking forward to it, of course, at the time you guys are listening to the show. I believe we're a week away, and I am looking forward to it. We are doing so many things. Tom, I know you're doing some sessions. What are you going to be doing at ISTE? So I'll be at the Energizer, uh, the Google Energizer on the Saturday of ISTE, um, doing some other things uh, with the, the some Google stuff. And uh, nothing, nothing I can promote right now, but uh, very excited. And it's Philadelphia. That's therefore oh. I will be there. I'm looking forward to seeing everybody in the city of Philadelphia, having some cheesesteaks, hanging out at Rittenhouse Square. I want to invite you guys to come to our sessions. If you are in the city early, Saturday morning at 8.30, we're going to be doing a three-hour educational podcasting workshop. Tom, i got to tell you, we have over 40 teachers signed up for this thing at 8.30 in the morning on Saturday. I'd love to get it past 50, maybe even 60, because what we're going to be doing is we're going to be doing a hands-on how to make a podcast. We're going to talk about studio podcasting classroom podcasting. We're going to be spending about a half an hour running around the convention center making podcasts and it is all happening on Saturday morning at 8.30 and if you are a technology coach, you cannot miss our Ask the Tech Coach session. It is going to be Saturday morning at 12.30 to 3.30. We're going to be doing our technology coach integration plan workshop. We're going to do three hours of how to be a tech coach. If you're new to to the position, if you're going to be going into your first year or you know what, if you been a tech coach for the last couple of years and you're enjoying this very podcast we welcome to have you guys we're going to be doing a great job introducing technology coaching in a little bit different way than before and of course if you're there on monday we've got our isti bite session at 8 30 and we were just offered two amazing opportunities first of all 2 30 on monday this is a lot tom first of all 2 30 on monday we're going to be doing a one hour podcasting workshop at 12 30 on monday we're going to be doing a podcast um creator studio i don't know if you've heard about these but they're gonna we're gonna be setting up in some of the lounges and we're gonna actually be doing hands-on podcasting to anybody that happens to be walking by and wants to learn how to get their hands wet we're going to be doing that and you know what throughout the week we're going to be working with microsoft we might be going over to the podcaster booth the think right booth you never know where you're going to find teacher cast popping up but if you see me stop me trip me in the hallways give me a big hug let me know that you guys are there we want to hear from you guys there's of course several great ways to reach out and be a part of this and all of our podcasts You can, of course, find out more information over at Ask the Tech Coach. And ladies and gentlemen, I have a big announcement to make. We are just about ready to pull the curtain off of a brand new experience for you guys. If you head on over to askthetechcoach.com, you'll see what we've been working on over at askthetechcoach.com. We have revamped the entire TeacherCast network, and we are excited to be launching it brand new at TeacherCast. And we want you guys to be there over at askthetechcoach.com. Once again, my guest today is Tom Mullaney. He is an educator from New Jersey. Am I getting that right, Tom? So originally from New York and then Pennsylvania. Right now I'm in North Carolina, though. Ah, I thought you were had a Pennsylvania connection in there. Talk to us a little bit about yourself, Tom. What, what are you doing these days? Where are you? So I am at a middle school in Raleigh, North Carolina, Carroll Middle School. And I am the tech coach there. Digital learning coach is my title. And that's something I've done in previous, you know, jobs, but most of my career was first in special education and then in secondary uh, history and in social studies, grades eight, nine, 10, and 11 in that time. And uh, yeah, just that those, you know, those experiences in the classroom really inform what I do now as a uh, digital learning coach. You know, I love the fact that every single co-host that we've had on over the last uh, couple months always has something different 
to bring to the technology coaching position. And we want to hear from you guys. If anybody out there would like to be a co-host, we are going to be recording all throughout the summer. And we're looking for some great technology integration specialists or tech coaches or whatever you call yourself to be on there. Find us over on Ask the Tech Coach. Or, of course, you can go over to askthetechcoach.com and let us know you'd like to be on the show. So... Tom, I am excited about this show. This is a topic that we are really, really near and dear to today. We are talking all about websites, web design, Google sites in specific. Um, I got to ask the silly question here. You, you've got some experience with web design and educational web design, don't you? That is correct. Uh, most of my education websites are these digital breakouts, these digital escape rooms. And I just like Google sites for that purpose. And it, you know, it's just a really nice and easy tool to, you know, to to present your content and make a, an attractive, you know, something really nice for teachers and students to to dig that, you know, dive into. You know, I love the fact that Google Sites over the last four, four and a half years or so have completely come in, transformed what's going on. And we'll talk a little bit about the history in a moment here. But I mean, the whole idea is that you can have your teachers and your students create an amazing looking website in a relatively short amount of time. And it's a dynamic website that anything really can go on it. What's your favorite thing that you like to do with Google Sites? So, well, all right. First of all, let me say something real quick. It, uh -oh. Yes, it is a very uh -oh. easy tool. Uh -oh. At the same time, I'm going to tell you right now, if you look around your PLN, you know, just see some people's t you know, Twitter bios and the Google sites they share there, because a lot of people make their main site a Google site. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing a lot of Google sites I do not like. I'm well, a lot of, yeah, a lot it, of sites, people are making things in Google sites that are just not looking that great. Well, um, look, it, it, it is, it is really, really difficult to make a site look bad sometimes. Right. But Google, Google has a way of, you know, if you don't know what you're doing, you can make a row with a nice background and then you can make a row under it with a completely contrasting background. Mm. And then under that, you can have a completely contrasting background. And look, I got to tell you, I work with some teachers. You work with some teachers who go, what's wrong with this? And they don't see what we see sometimes. So we're going to, I don't know, Tom, I think we're going to have a good time with this show. I'm looking forward to having this on here. By the way, um, I am wearing my brass knuckles. I know you are too. So if things guys uh, get a little bit uh, heated here, um, I don't know. This might be the last time I have Tom on. I don't know. Let's have a good time with all of this stuff here. But let's just take a look at this. We're. I, I want to talk today about the traditional teacher web page, website, whatever we want to call it here. I have this theory that teachers don't understand the power of what a classroom teacher page, teacher website can be, right? We all ask our teachers to create a website. And then what we find is that in March and April and May, their website says, welcome back to September. They create these things because they have to, and then nothing happens the rest of the year. Do you have that same issue? So to me, uh, a teacher website is the kind is the thing that would make a student or a parent say, hey, my teacher is relevant and happening and contemporary and I want to be in that class. I don't know that. You see, if you're if you're going to put, you know, this is what's happening this week or this is what's happening next week on your website, you have to be committed and dedicated to keeping that up. And well, what you well, reference there, that's well, a problem. If it says, you know, October 7th unit, you know, then, then we have a problem, right? This is June. Or your school has to have a culture that says this is how we create a digital classroom or every teacher is updating these things weekly. Well, I, th I mean, I look, I think what works for a teacher, whether that's classroom or a, or a classroom site or remind or however that communication works. Like, I think you got to, you know, make that work. I think for a teacher website and I'm coming from that secondary background of, okay, we're teaching from like enlightenment to cold war. I would want that site to be a general overview of all the resources that a student would need in that class. All right. So that, that there's a bit of a timelessness to it so that it doesn't matter where you pop into it. Okay, I need to look back at the French Rev stuff. There's something. There's going to be some useful stuff there. That's what I would aim for uh, for a teacher website. 
I, I'm going to have fun with this one. This is going to be a good show here already. I can tell this. So when we're looking at this, should do you feel teacher websites, like if I say teacher pages, that's cool too. But if do you feel a teacher website should be a simple thing or should they be a little bit more complicated or is it a teacher portfolio? Like when you go to your school website and then you look up a teacher and you see their website as a parent, mm. what do you want to see? So, well, one, I'm not, not actually a parent, but this is how I would say, suggest teachers tackle this. Think about what parents would want to see. They probably don't need to see the nitty gritty of every single unit, but a broad overview with, you know, this is, you know, uh, even if it's just here's a couple essay prompts, here's some here's some vocabulary, so a Quizlet deck of vocabulary. Talk, one of my favorite things to embed in, in Google Sites are Quizlet decks. Um, that would be all. That would all be really good. And then, as a teacher, I could see making more you know deeper sites for each unit, or maybe even some for certain lessons or activities. That's where I would go a little bit deeper with it. Um, what's parent facing? that doesn't have to be so explicit. But what about the idea that a website is there to really serve as that teaching hub? I mean, right now, so many teachers out there, and, and, and I, I, this is a Google problem. This is, I've talked about this many, many times. This is a Google problem. Google put out Classroom first. And mm -hmm. everybody jumped on the classroom bandwagon. And classroom is wonderful. I love Google Classroom. But then a year or maybe two, a year later, then they brought out Google Sites. And, you know, I, I'm sitting here on, on a campaign trying to say that Google Classroom and Google Sites are really one application. Sites is where you put your stuff and Classroom is where you distribute the materials that you're going to be teaching off of. And if you put them all together, that kind of equals what a canvas or what a schoology does where you've got your digital classroom and then you've got your way to distribute your digital documents to different people but because they put out classroom first and everybody jumped on classroom it's been hard to get into the habit of saying all of your lessons and stuff are on a website you teach off the website you live off the website i think that can work for a lot of teachers absolutely hey Here's my here's my unit, you know, go unit by unit and lesson one, lesson two, lesson three. I could definitely see that at the same time. I could see teachers who would say, listen, I just need I just need to put up the essential facts and information in one place. And then the nitty gritty, you know, when you think of 180 days worth of lessons, I'm going to just do that in classroom. So to me, that's, I think it's a, like a lot of things, it's teacher comfort. But then what happens at the end of the year, right? The thing I love about Classroom is that it does, it manages those documents, it puts stuff together. But then at the end of the year, if you archive your Classroom, all of the work, all, you know, if you make a, a, an assignment in Classroom and there's YouTube videos in there and there's all those other things, at the end of the year, when you archive that Classroom, your links change. It, it's not where you need to. You're spending time searching. But if you build a website with all of that stuff on there and you embed the video and you put a doc over here and you make it look pretty for five seconds, those links don't change. Everything is where it needs to be. And I always teach my teachers, if it's not about today. It's about that fourth dimension of next year, it's done for you. Next year, you're, you know, like, get it done now. Later on, you're going to thank me. Oh, I think there's a lot of value in that. I think absolutely. At the same time, you know, I could see, you know, if I, depending, I could see, you know, you don't have to archive every single classroom class, right? So you can reuse posts. So I could keep one, one of my sections of AP Euro around, or let's say AP Bio, a show I'm obsessed with right now. <laughs> uh, I keep one of those sections alive. I don't archive it. And then the next year, I can always reuse posts, right? Reuse posts are magic. I love reuse posts to classroom. Um, so you want to, I, I really, to me, this is like teacher preference. Like what, right. what is sustainable for you as an educator? So let, let me ask you this, because I, 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 you know, we know each other a little bit through, through text messages and stuff like that. But this is, I think this is the first time you've been on the show. Do you consider yourself to be visual or analytical in your thinking? Boy, I, that's a <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I I think I know the answer, but but what do you what what how I'll do you say analytical? And and see that makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. uh, me being a visual person, 
me being the creative person, I'd rather put it all up on a wall or a website. Mm. And it's always there. And if I can move it around or I can stand in front of it, I can teach in front of it. But I find that the people who are more pushing back on that idea and saying, no, it's in classroom. It's great. I'm going, but classroom is this, this basically it's a list of everything. It's not visual. I can't see the YouTube video. I see a link to the YouTube video. And I find that if, if you're analytical classroom is great and don't talk to me. And if you're visual, you go, Oh, I can see the possibilities and I can see how next year. And it's a weird thing, Tom, of depending on how people think is how they take those kinds of the, the, that philosophy of classroom versus sites or classroom and sites. Mm, yeah. I, you know, I, I, I really do like uh, Google sites and putting stuff out there. Uh, and the other, well, the one thing I would also say is that what if you have something that's meant only for distribution within the walls of your classroom? Perfect. That's why right. Google Docs has privacy on it. Right. Okay. But now, so now you have a website. So that's something I always, it always uh, makes me cringe when I see someone's put out a Google site that's public facing. And then one of their embedded Google Drive files is not. But that website's not for you. That website's for them. So why is it public facing? Because people don't know how to do publishing settings the right way. Right. But but they've also shared it somewhere where I should where I as a general public shouldn't be able to see. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Yeah. And you have to think of your audience when you create this, create these things. Is this for families? Is this for students? Is this for anyone is this for, hey, I want people to see the things I'm doing in my classroom and in my, in my practice, which might be, you know, principals at other schools. Who knows right. what this could be, right? And so you always have to think about audience when you create. Well, I love teaching how to make a membership site, right? Because mm-hmm. you can go into your Google site and you can say only these accounts can see this. I mean, we do it here with our Tech Coach Mastermind, which, by the way, guys, if you're looking to join a great professional development network, um, we are going to be relaunching our mastermind starting in August. Go over to teachercast.net, not, teachercast.net slash mastermind. There is a sign-up sheet you can get yourself on the waiting list. We will let you know when, when registration is coming up. That's teachercast.net slash mastermind. But Tom, I see this a lot in things like sports clubs and PTAs and stuff where, yeah, they've got a website, but you have to be logged in Mm. to see whatever it is. And it could be anything from it's just private information, but it's a PTA or it's got student names on it. So, yeah, maybe the whole website is curricular and it's it's public and, you know, but maybe there's one section where you've got some student work that can't be seen by the general population, but but the students can see it. Yeah, well, I, th- I mean, I think there's all sorts of ways to do that, right? I mean, I think in Google Sites, I like to keep it real simple. And if I'm going to publish anything outside of my domain, right, I'm outside of my work domain, then I want to make sure that it, basically everything on there is should be viewed by the public, right? Mm-hmm. By, and then that, and basically families fits falls under public, right? Right. Um, if, if they don't want to see it, they just won't go there. Right. Uh, but I just, I don't want to have anybody come to one of my websites or come to something I've created and it's, you know, access denied or request access. So like the, you know, we just, I don't, I don't want to have that out there. That's just kind of bad form. So let's back up a little bit because not everybody here is in a Google school district. We've got a lot okay. of tech coaches that are in 0365 school districts. We have a lot of tech coaches listening that might be in iPad school districts. I want to go through a few different ways because really when we look at the word website, we mm-hmm. could mean web page. We could also mean digital portfolio. We could mean, uh, I like to use the term digital hub. Now there's a few different applications that I've seen teachers use and I think they're all fantastic. Um, Tom, have you used Weebly? I have not. No, I have not used Weebly. Uh, keep, let's keep going, but no, I haven't used Weebly. Weebly of course is a free, um, website developer. Right. And really, when I talk about websites, there, there's two ways of looking at a website. One is a series or a group of static pages that has a blogging feature on it. And then the other one here is WordPress. Uh, Tom, I'm assuming you've used WordPress of some kind. I have used WordPress for my personal website, which is okay. also really my blog. Right. right. I have and- used it for years. And it, it really it, I've taught kids how to use WordPress. 
WordPress is the industry standard. Yes, 33% right? of the internet, and that's over 67 trillion websites. So you're, you're doing pretty good at their WordPress. Yes. But WordPress is more of a blog, meaning it's a diary that has static pages to it. So mm -hmm. they're, they're kind of the yin and the yang there. So some people have great looking WordPress sites. And, and when I say WordPress time, you know, we can add edu blogs, we can add kid blog, we can add, you know, all, all of those kind of work, you know, wordpress.com.org. That's a different conversation. Um, other things that can be used for portfolios. I'm a major fan of using OneNote, right? It's, it's an online place. You can store things, you can organize things, you can embed things. And if you're in an O365 school, you might be using OneNote to show off and showcase what's happening in school. Are, are you a, a OneNote user, Tom? So I am not, and I'm not in a 365, you know, we're Google. So I think mm -hmm. we have access actually to a lot of the three, that stuff, but you know, Google's, you know, oh, yeah. one out. I, I think OneNote is great. I love the handwriting components. You know, I, I use OneNote all the time with my five-year-olds. They, they take the pen, they start to draw. And, and now we have that stuff across all of our, our, our devices. But I think for anybody who's in a Google school here, you know, definitely Google sites is that, that online digital portfolio show off thing. And, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about why Google Sites and why they're useful, but let's kind of deep dive here because, as you said, many, how do you put it, Tom? Many teachers don't understand basic web design. Is that, is that a fair statement? That is, and there's just, there's certain things you can do. If you want me, I can go into a couple. Please. Two, all right. So, ba batter, batter's me. up here. You actually asked earlier, what's my favorite thing to do with Google Sites? And so I'll give you uh, actually kind of where the inspiration for this comes from. Are you familiar with the uh, Crash Course History series on YouTube? No, I don't. We'll, so, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll put a link to it on the site, though. Uh, John, you know, John Green, the author. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's kind of funny. Uh, I was first exposed to John Green through his Crash Course YouTube channel. And my wife one day had a library book and the author said, John Green. And I said, yeah, that's funny. This guy I watch on YouTube all the time with my kids, he's, his name is John Green, too. And we eventually <laughs> pieced it together. That's a, one and the same person. Nice. So if you watch, especially the U.S. History Crash Course uh, series, all they're doing is taking copyright friendly images and they're doing things with them. And they're using them to make something artistic and make something new. And it's their crash course videos. They also have the, the thought bubble animation, but just put that aside for a second. The first thing you can do to make your website look nice is use actual professional imagery. And that by that, I mean, m most of the stuff in Wikimedia Commons, some stuff on, on Wikipedia, you're going to find are amateur photos, but a lot of it's official taken by professionals or actual professional art from, you know, from hi historical art. The other thing I would say is go to a site called Unsplash and use that for your imagery. Just go to unsplash.com. It's very easy to cite uh, in Unsplash. And they even say you can use this without citing it, even though we should be teaching our kids and, and just ourselves, we should be citing it, right? And so just that right there, that's one thing, using professional imagery, not, you know, Google drawings, no offense to Google drawings, but use some professional imagery. Well, but, but using it in, in tandem with, I mean, I, I just happened to click on Unsplash and, you know, all the graphics here are of various sizes. I shouldn't say graphics. I should say images, mm -hmm. but they're all of various sizes. I know I, I will take something like this and I'm looking at this beautiful mountain scenery. I might show a teacher how to put that vertical image into drawings, make it a certain size. And then there you have your banner image for your site. You could probably do it with just the unsplash as long as it's like a landscape orientation because mm -hmm. those images are really big, which is good. Uh, one thing I would say, though, is once we're in drawings, be careful, like no word art, you know, no. like, right? There's, no, strict, so, strictly as a cropping resizing tool. Right, right. Um, and then the second thing I would say is when you're designing in Google Sites, really anything, you have to pay attention to color contrast. I see too many websites where it's like a white background with then like uh, cornflower blue text, really light blue text. You can't you can't make it out. It doesn't the text doesn't pop. Uh, there's a couple of things you can do to change that. So if, if, have you used the Colorzilla Google Chrome extension? I, I have. It's, it's one of my favorites. 
it, it is my wife actually works uh she's a web programmer she does not work in education and i think it's the only chrome extension that we both have in our google chrome <laughs> Uh, so Colorzilla, what it'll do is it'll grab any color, the exact hexadex six digit alphanumerical code of a color off a website. So, if, oh, I literally like, let's say uh, the, the example I use is gritty. Like I want to use one of the shades of orange on the uh, Flyers mascot gritty. So if I want to grab one of those oranges, I have to go get, you know, I install Colorzilla. I click on it and it gives me a hexadex code that I can then plug right into Google Sites in the theme area, make that my code. But then I go to a website called the Web Aim Co Color Contrast Checker to see how that orange contrasts with, with white and with black. And now I can see, all right, I, use, I should use this with black, I should use this with white, and text will pop and things will be very clear and easy to see. And that's like that gets you on the road to making a you know, a, a visually appealing website. Well, it's a, it's one of those things that we work on a lot with our teachers, right? The first thing that a teacher wants to do when they open up Google sites is to pick a color, move a color, change the font, uh, change the size. And, and my website philosophy says that should be the last thing that you do. You should be worrying about the content and what comes in it. Now, before I get Tom's thought process on the order and how to really train our teachers to make a great looking website, we're going to take a quick break over here. This is Ask the Tech Coach podcast, episode number 53. You can find everything in the archives over at askthetechcoach.com. We'll be right back talking to Tom Elaney all about Google Sites in a moment. Friends, before we move on with our show, I wanted to let you guys know I have been in education now for almost 20 years, and I've seen the changes some students have come to face every single day, whether it's going through school hungry, not being able to see a doctor when they're sick, or not getting the proper rest at night. These challenges make it hard for kids to focus on their learning. I remember a story of a student who came to my office one day and she could barely stay awake due to all the circumstances happening around her at home that were beyond her control. I didn't know what I could do and I wanted to be able to help her out in any way that I could. Thankfully, Concordia University in Portland is leading the way with their three to PhD program that helps to combat students' fears, freeing them to pursue their highest dreams. They're revolutionizing education by creating a holistic model that provides groceries, health care, and even clothing to students right here on campus, helping them thrive and helping our communities strengthen and grow. Concordia's College of Education offers online and on-campus programs where students have the opportunity to learn about a more compassionate approach to education and see how nurturing the whole student can lead to amazing things. To learn more about how you can help students conquer their monsters and achieve their highest dreams, visit cu-portland.edu forward slash let's conquer. That's cu-portland.edu forward slash let's conquer. And we're, use the hashtag nature educate grow. And welcome back. We are here at Ask the Tech Coach. This is episode number 53. I'm talking to educator and technology coach Tom Mullaney. Now, Tom, before we took a break, we were talking about finding these different tools, finding things that aren't quite part of the normal Google Sites toolbox, but using it to create a nice website. And we were mentioning that... It's not easy sometimes to teach our teachers how to make a great looking website. Now, you mentioned two Chrome extensions. What else do you have in your Mulaney Chrome extension or toolbox of goodies that's going to help us make a nice looking website? Well, so a couple things. One, I think what you put on the website definitely counts, right? Content obviously counts. And I think Google Sites. I don't know if you agree with me on this, but Google Sites is a little bit, you compared it to Classroom earlier. I think it's, you're right in that uh, both of those tools, you use Sites for about a week, two weeks, use Classroom for a week or two weeks. You're an expert in that tool. They are very, very, they're, they're designed to be user-friendly. This is not complex, no cr crazy stuff, right? Um, so I think once you have teachers, like they hit the ground running and let's say, you know, administration has expect expectations of what should be on their website. Okay, great. 
once you once all that training has come in, I think then it's it's totally appropriate to bring in some design training, some things we talked about earlier. I think it's valuable for the kids because the kids should learn how to, you know, it's a real world skill creating for the web. Now, uh, as far as what to put on there, and I'm thinking through the lens of blended learning, you're talking about, hey, let's put lesson materials on there, right? So, and again, I'm coming from a history background, but two great Google tools are Tour Creator and My Maps. I don't know if, uh, how much you've played with uh, Tour Creator or My Maps. But They're great. Yes. Is, is Tour Creator still in beta? Tour Creator is, is launched. It's, it is what it is. Okay. Um, and, and it, you know, t any Tour Creator tour can be viewed in Google Expeditions, but it can also be viewed embedded in a google site and it works beautifully it looks lovely you can add the points of interest with images with uh with sound oh it's 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 it looks really nice it's a really nice way to tell a story um now as far as external uh and oh by the way i'd also say uh you know throw in have some fun you know uh, i don't know if you've played how, how much you've played with google jamboard Unfortunately, right now, Jamboard does not embed natively into Google Sites. Mm -hmm. um, it's the, the only Google Drive file that, that doesn't. But, of course, you can always download a frame of a jam as an image. Bam, put it in a, in a site. You can download an entire jam as a PDF. That can go in the site. So you can do it that way. As far as some of my favorite external tools, I already mentioned to you um, – Quizlet. I think Quizlet yeah. decks look beautiful on Google sites. They, they have a really nice product. Thinglink. Thinglink is great because it doesn't open any tabs, but you can embed all these different things. So there's all, you know, all these things that can appear uh, in, in one image. So that's awesome. It works great with um, YouTube videos and Google Forms and, and Google Slides. And one, well, uh, PictoChart, yeah. I, I really like PictoChart for this purpose because it's got, uh, for the infographics, you can hover over with your mouse and that works nicely. You know, and I, one, one more, uh, I'll just say real quick uh, that you introduced me to is TimelineJS. Yeah. TimelineJS looks really nice. So yeah, use that. I, I'm a big fan of using Padlet. And okay. using it in a way that you can actually have a comment section or a blog. Because many people look at Google Sites and they say there, there's no blogging function. I'm going, yes. But if you put a Padlet on top of it, now you've got a student blog where they can write and they can leave comments and they can thumbs up and all those different things. And it, it looks beautiful. All right. And you don't need to have the paid version of Padlet. You can just use one of the three or four, however many they give you for free. And yeah. Padlet is a fantastic tool for that. I haven't tried Wakelet on there have you uh, have you joined the wakelet wave so i haven't tried uh wakelet on there just yet no um so, yeah that's an interesting an interesting one right there as far as you want to create you know curate a lot of stuff on, in in one place mm -hmm. um but I, I haven't tried wakelet yet you know by the way while we're ta talking about this one thing i would say about and one of the things that I think is really it's it's happening now and it's going to be bigger and better as, as time goes on is digital portfolios for students in, yeah. in sites. And one of the problems with sites is that embedding sound is impossible. You can't you really. Put, well, I'm, I'm, I, okay. let me explain. So you can't just put a, a, an audio file in it just this is actually a little bit like Jamboard. You can't just put an audio file in your drive and then just say, boom, put it on my on my website, on my Google site it doesn't work. However, there are a couple workarounds. One is actually Google Sites, because now in Google, or, sorry, I said Sites. We're talking about Google Sites. Google Slides, they're, they're too similar. Uh, Google Slides, you can now uh, put sound there. So if you, now you can embed that slide deck and it has sound, so that's a way to get sound. And the other one is something I just mentioned, ThingLink. You can put sound on a ThingLink image put that on your Google site and bam, you have sound embedded in Google sites. So yeah, that's, but but yeah. all you have to do is you put an MP3 in your Google drive, make that file open to the public. So it can't be a private MP3. It's got to be open. And then you can embed that directly onto your site and you've got a, yeah, you've got a playable. I am pretty sure that at least in my, your miles may vary, but in my experience, every time I've tried to put an audio file, um, it doesn't. Let me go into my playground site Ooh. right now. Ooh. 
everyone's in their car going, is it going to work? Is it going to work? Oh, my goodness. Uh, let me uh, let me see. I'm just I'm going in my. Uh, I, and then, by the way, that's something just a little um, just a little strategy. I have a playground site that I will never publish. <laughs> me, too. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And I just call it. I said I call it Tom playground site. And just the reason is so I'm going to go to file type. So when I go to file type, there is no audio in the drop down. No, so it's a it's a hidden thing. But if you if you op, if you put an MP3 in your drive and then you grab the URL of that, like the shared link, you can oh, you can just we, you can just paste that shared link onto a site page and pop. You've got an audio file. So let me ask you this. Does it play on yeah. there? Or does it pop? Yes. Out? Yes, it plays. OK. All right, so all right, all right. Tom and I are going to have some fun after the show is over. We're going to do a little show and Tom here. Uh, I well, the one thing I would say about that is the whole point of Google Sites is that it's supposed to be point click and easy, mm -hmm. right? Um, to me, like I hope that they get that a little bit better. Uh, I'm just, let me try to put in some. Oh, I would uh, look. There, there's a lot of things, by the way. Anybody that's out there, if you're still listening, anybody that's out there, there's a ton of things that Google Sites can do that nobody tells you that Google Sites can do. I mean, the whole right side menu, I never even use it. I just grab the URL and then I just go paste. Like uh, I do a command or a control V, and then boom, there's your embed for your doc or your sheet or your slide or your video. You know, whatever. I never use that menu on the right side. For me, it kind of slows me down a little bit. Right. Ah. Uh, well. I. So. I. I. Well. I. I do like the, the. The. The wheel. I like the wheel a lot. Um. I will. I do like buttons. Uh. The dividers sometimes are really good if you have. If you find yourself with a lot of white space, a lot yep. of white pixels, dividers can help out. Mm -hmm. uh, and now they have the new image carousel too, which is not. Part that's of, nice. That's not part of the. Uh, the wheel just yet. Um, additionally, you, you know, you have your maps and your YouTube, uh, there, although I would say as far as YouTube videos and videos on these sites, think about your audience. If, you know, if you intend them to watch the entire video, then put that YouTube video there. Right. Um, if you don't, then you might want to use either slides again or mm -hmm. Edpuzzle to just chop it up and just so that they see only what you want them to see without oh. leaving your site. Tom, that is a great suggestion. I often say that Google Slides is the best video editor that Google has because you can put a video onto your Google Slide. You can chop up the beginning, the end. You can even do it over two or three slides if you want to do certain pieces of a video and sl use slides as your way to to throw movies out there. Um, it is absolutely easy. I love teaching teachers how to, you know, instead of making a YouTube homepage, make a Google site, put all the videos there. Right. You know, if you're if you're having your students go into YouTube, you're forgetting the law of YouTube, which is YouTube has one rule. It's to get you to watch more YouTube. Well, if all the videos that you want your kids to see are on a website, um, they're not going to be locked into the YouTube loop. It's also one of the reasons why I like doing videos on sites, not on classroom, because if you're on classroom and you click on a YouTube video, it takes you into YouTube where the kids are in a loop and everything's this and that. Um, there's a lot of different things in here that you can certainly do. I, I, I want to talk briefly here because I, 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 I'm sure you guys have questions out there that are, that are looking at this. Of course, you can always go over to Twitter at Ask the Tech Coach. We'd love to hear your thoughts and stuff about this episode. As you can see, Tom and I are very, very passionate about Google Sites. Um, things that you do with Google Sites that you're, that you're excited about. I know you had said that you do some breakouts using Google Sites. Talk to us a little bit about that. And then what are there some of those, you know, non websitey things are you making into Google sites? So um, with the Google sites, so I think um, digital portfolios, I think are going to be a big one, uh, both. Honestly, I think both for teachers and for students. And that to me is just where you showcase the things as a student you're most proud of. And that's one of the reasons why. I like to tell people when it comes to Google Sites, think beyond docs and slideshows. Think about interesting things that you can embed that show some creativity and look really nice and professional. Uh, so to me, like, you know, even something like uh, Quizlet, which may not be the most exciting thing ever, but one, it's students like taking ownership of their own learning to get themselves prepared. And two, it just looks really nice. Same with, say, a PictoChart or a Timeline.js. Um, now, as far as those breakouts, basically they are a digital escape room that tell a story. 
So what's locked? Why is it locked? And how is it connected to history? Or, well, in my case, it's usually history, but I've collaborated with math, science, English teachers around this uh, strategy. And so it's just a real nice way. And the biggest thing about this to me is this, is that we say the four C's, right? And one of them is creativity. Well, how are we supposed to encourage and foster creativity if we as teachers don't show it ourselves? Mm. So that's why... You know, if you can make a nice digital product, and I think Sites is a great platform for doing that, then you really owe it to your kids to say, hey, look at this thing I created that's going to help you learn. You know, do you think you could create something as nicer, dare I say nicer, and go from there? You know, there's so many different things that we've used Sites for. I think I, I, I'm not kidding when I say I've probably done more than a thousand Google sites because all of our teachers over the last four years have been asked and required to use their teacher pages in Google sites, all of their curricular stuff we're using in Google sites. Mm. And then on top of that, I mean, I, there's an entire web world of teacher cast. That's just Google sites where all the presentations that I do, I've transferred away from WordPress into a Google site just because it's so much easier to, to create and move rather than dealing with a WordPress website. I mean, you know, the teacher cast site is, is beautiful, but it's, it's clunky when you're trying to be building on the fly with these different things. Whereas with Google sites, it's just drag and drop and you move things around and, and insert a doc or a slide or a map or whatever it is. And so that way, when you come to ISTE and you're there on Saturday morning at eight 30, you get a chance to see all the Google slides that we're doing and all the different ways that we're using websites. Tom, with your technology coaching and your presenting and stuff, do you use Google sites as your presentation vehicle or how are you presenting yourself? Uh, these days? Wow. You know, I think it really depends on, uh, on, on what the topic is. I have presented on Google sites and this is back. And I don't mean presenting on the topic of Google. I mean, like using a Google site as, Oh, well, uh, well the reason I bring up that is because I actually made a site now that I think I may have since deleted. Cause I look back and I like, hated the design of it actually. And that to me, it's like, you can have the most useful stuff in any kind of place but if it looks terrible no one's diving into it um, to me uh, screencasts are actually a really uh, powerful thing so if if I just have some videos ready for you you know after I've demoed it you have the videos to fall back on um, that to me is a really useful thing um, I think for my you know I personally love classroom because it just you just put all your materials in one place and I get it, you know, districts don't allow other people in their class and that varies by district, but we all can just use our own personal accounts for classroom. Hey, right. I'm doing a session on this. And when you do that, have your topics laid out. I like to put one emoji in each of my, at the front of each of my topics, to give you a little visual cue, break up that white pixel, all those white pixels and go from there and get in that way. I have some activities for you. I have some you know, work for you to do. And so right now it is classroom, but I could see design, you know, designing a Google site for around a certain topic, uh, depending, you know, depending on how many resources I wanted to share. We've been using them in our music department, you know, instead of the traditional paper um, program, we either give a QR code or we put a link up on top and we send, you know, you know, he, here is the visual a program, right? It's better than wasting paper that the teachers and parents are just going to throw out that night. Um, if you ever spell a kid's name wrong, you can fix it right away. But then on top of that, as the band and choir are playing, um, you can watch videos, you can look at pictures, you can see a slideshow, you can see superlatives, you can see all these different things, uh, you know, while, while the events are going on. And it, it works even really well. We use Google Sites to make a football statistics website. So as the parents and stuff are on Friday night watching the football game, um, um, one of our teachers was a statistician. He was sitting on the sidelines using a Google spreadsheet. And every time he updated the spreadsheet, it would update the football website. So the parents were actually ch keeping stats and track. And because we were using forms and sheets and graphs and stuff during halftime, when the coaches took the kids in, they had everything in a graph and in a chart on the website for the game. And I know over the last couple of years, that's been extremely helpful to our coaches rather than looking at a spreadsheet full of numbers. Now they're actually seeing bar, bar graphs. 
Right. They, to visualize that data. That's really cool. That's neat. That's nice stuff. We want to know what you guys are doing and how you guys are using Google Sites. You can, of course, tweet us any examples. We would love to have you guys tweet out some examples of Google Sites that you guys are doing over to Ask the Tech Coach. Or if you want to go over to askthetechcoach.com, this is episode number 53. P- please feel free to leave us a message in the comments. Leave some links. We would love to hear from you. Tom, it is the beginning of the summertime, and that only means that there is eight more weeks before school starts and seven more weeks before Google totally changes everything on us. What are you looking forward to? If there was one or two things, since, since we both know Google is listening to this podcast, if you were to say, dear Google, I want this natively for Google Sites, other than a color picker, what would it be? Oh, uh, good question. So... Uh, well, first and foremost, I really want uh, Jamboard to integrate right away. Just boom. Like, a- and if you look at jamboard.google.com, they, it has that lovely, you know, you see your jams and there's little arrows, the front, and, you know, right and left arrows in each jam. I want it to be just that smooth, just like look that beautiful. So that's my first uh, desire or wish for, for sites. Ah, beyond that, ooh. Um, that is a really good cry. You know, I do have one that you're looking for. I would like to have easier access to the photo banner. And cause you, you, you know, when I mentioned earlier that you, you, you take your photo and you stick it into uh drawing, you know, usually the, the dimensions I give you is 1200 wide by 400 tall. And if you can crop that, then you've got a nice little banner for the top of the page, right? And you can do whatever you want there. But then when it's responsive, that little thing flies all over the place. Um, I, I wish the graphics were a little bit easier. I, I think that'd be one of my wishes. And yes, having a button that says insert audio, so that way the average teacher wouldn't understand that that exists. I think that's a biggie for me. Yeah, right now the audio, I actually played around with with what you did. So yeah, you're right. You can do that. Um, you can embed audio by getting that share link at a drive and then just using the share link to, to embed it. Uh, the thing is, so I'm seeing it now. It's, it's a big gray box and it's just got a play button. And, and it so the, re- resize the box. Oh, okay. I can resize the box. That's good. At the same time, like I don't, I mean, I guess I could add the text and whatnot um, to kind of give it, uh, you know, a, you know, I, yeah. So it is there. It is, right? It is. And this is the Google thing. I, I always say Google is wonderful until it needs to be. It is there. But if you don't know that it exists, you're never going to stumble upon that. Right. I mean, and I personally, I would definitely I'm going to say for the time being, I'm going to use like th- I'm going to use thing link in slides because mm-hmm. I can add all these images and and, and, and well, with with um, thing link interactivity, uh, which is really nice. That's that's one. I feel like, I don't know. I mean, I guess there's all these different ed tech apps. There's all these different companies and they're all trying to, you know, do something different. Oh yeah. Uh, ThingLink is one that I just feel like don't sleep on them. Like just cause it, it, now obviously Google sites helps you not open a ton of tabs because you can embed things. Right. Right. Um, at the same time, whenever just, you know, you, when you use Google and just the internet in general, you wind up with 20, 20 to 50 tabs open and thing link is like the fighter against that. And I just really appreciate that. I guess the other thing that I would be looking for is just an easier. I, I don't, I don't know. Right. Like I know what's coming down the pike. They said that themes are coming down a way to create a theme and then save it across different websites or have an administrator push it down among like, that's always the hard part, right? Like as soon as they came out with like common footers, that was neat. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But now that, you know, they basically announced that, you know, a, a school district can create a template and then push that down. Look, it's about time. I, I, it took us an hour to say that, but it's about time for some of those different things. You know, would I love to see it have a native blogging feature to it? Sure. You know, would I love to have it um, integrate with Google Keep? Sure. Like it's one yeah. of those apps that doesn't have the Keep calendar and and whatever next to it. Sure. Would love to see that. Um, and, you know, these things are coming. Would it, would it be nice if they could just, you know, blink and next week at ISTE they'll announce all these great things? 
Who knows? Stay tuned. But I do know that next week we've got a great episode. We're going to be talking all about ISTE 2019. We're going to have some great guests on and talking about how they're going to be handling their shows at, over at, at SD. Tom, one more time, I want to say thank you for being here. Talk to us a little bit about what you're doing at SD and where can we find you on your socials? So you can find me on my socials uh, at Tom E. Mullaney on Twitter. Uh, you can find me on YouTube. I'm going to you know, just search for Tom Mullaney and uh, Tom Mullaney.com. That is spelled with two L's, unlike the comedian John Mullaney, who spells it with one L. Uh, I'll be at ISTE on Saturday. I got the Innovator Energizer. That'll be a lot of fun. Catch up with a lot of people. And I'm just doing some... Um, Google education things uh, throughout Monday and Tuesday. And I just uh, get me to Blackbird Pizzeria. I'm, that's, by the way, that's one of the things I'm saying it right now. If you are attending ISTE and you are not taking advantage of Philadelphia, there's a lot of things you can do before and after ISTE during the day. Yes. Say, please take advantage of it for crying out loud. Yeah, there's so many different things there. And, and, you know, the convention center is not too far from everything. So take a walk in the park, go see the Liberty Bell, go go get a, pr- a pizza, a pretzel. If you're at the Reading Terminal Market, guys, ice cream. Lots of good stuff going on there. We want to know what you guys are doing. You can reach us over on AskTheTechCoach.com. This is episode number 53. And leave us a, a message over on Twitter at AskTheTechCoach. We would love to keep in touch with you guys. We're also looking for some great guests and co-hosts throughout the summer. So if you'd be interested in sharing your passions with other technology coaches, we would love to hear from you. Don't forget that our Ask the Tech Coach Mastermind is going to be starting up again in August, kind of September-ish. You can head on over to teachercast.net slash mastermind and learn more information, and you can sign up to be put on the waiting list. We would love to have you guys in our next cohort. Well, guys, that wraps it up for this episode of the Ask the Tech Coach podcast. On behalf of Tom and everybody here on the TeacherCast Educational Network, work. My name is Jeff Bradbury, reminding you to keep up the great work in your classrooms and continue sharing your passions with your students.